It's toast! How about that for a new intro? <laughs> What's going on, everybody? Uh, appreciate the uh, intro. What was his name again? I forgot about it. What is it, Kamish? Organics. Yeah, that is awesome. Really appreciate you guys taking the time out to do that. Um, really, really, that's just like really, really cool. But uh, what's up? It's plate coverage. It's June third, Kamish. How are we today? We're doing good, man. The the academy I run had a really successful weekend. Our high school guys won a big tournament. Our youth guys are developing, so feel good. And uh, you know the bets are cashing, which is always nice as well. Yeah. About you. Uh, fantastic. Me and uh, Kyle had a really, really good Sunday. I think we were like 11 and one combined on Sunday. So, uh, fresh off of a, uh, nice Cardinals first five money line hit today. That one just feels extra good. Cause when the people are extra mean in the conference <laughs> our comments and they tell you how dumb you are and all this stuff. So it feels really, really good when those ones cash. So, you know, just like off the rip, just a PSA, Justin Verlander is 41 years old. I mean, he, we, we have to chill with uh, JV's a lock. JV's going to dominate. JV's going to, like, blow through the sun. The man's 41 years old. I'm good with him on the road. There's a reason he doesn't pitch a lot at home. I mean, there's a reason his last seven stars, only two of them been at home. I, I truly believe they try to schedule him on the road as much as possible. They're never going to come out and say that. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, and if you take a look at, like, his last 10 starts um, in Houston, just hasn't been great. Um, and that's why I illustrated that on the show today. Uh, cards, 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 baby. They're warming up. They are warming up. But anywho, um, there's lots and lots to talk about. Uh, the Yankees absolutely bent over uh, every team in uh, every team in California they saw over the weekend. That was fun. Uh, did you get a chance to see any of that? I didn't get a, lot, a chance to watch a lot of live baseball this weekend. But I mean, wh when you look at the the players of the month and you see Aaron Judge wins American League Player of the Month. Luis Gill's the AL Pitcher of the Month and the AL Rookie of the Month. The Yankees are obviously doing something right. The Yankees just keep winning, 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 man. Juan Soto's on pace for 40-plus home runs. Judge has been on an absolute tear. The rest of that lineup is starting to hit the ball pretty well. Giancarlo has been way better than people have expected. And this team still doesn't even have Garrett Cole. You know, who knows if and when we'll, we'll see Cole this year. But well, we do know that he is – I do know that I read today uh, Jake Mintz, who is a – recorder for uh, Yahoo, uh, part of the Sestavez barbecue crew, uh, said that he will be, uh, Cole's going to be starting tomorrow in double A Somerset uh, against live double A or double A bats. So uh, the journey for Mr. Cole to come back to the Bronx uh, will be starting tomorrow. So that's a good sign if you are a Yankees fan, that's for sure. Yeah, I'll just, I'll believe it when I see it. I feel like we've been through the, through this a lot with the Noah Syndergaards and the DeGroms and like all these guys who are trying to come back from, some sort of elbow issue mid-season. Some guys have been successful. I mean, look, Kyle Bradish is throwing the ball really well right now. I, I know he got touched up over the weekend, but Bradish is throwing the ball really well right now, pitching through an injury. Tristan McKenzie's been, I guess you could say, adequate, you know, not pitching at full health. So we'll see. We'll see. I just, Garrett Cole, though, was just – he was starting to regress. Uh, a lot of the underlying metrics show he was starting to regress, regress a lot towards the second half of last year. Velo's down. Uh, spin rates are something to keep an eye on. So if he's not at 100%, it's going to be interesting to see what he has to offer. Yeah. Um, I'm really curious to see Luis Hill um, come October when that time comes because uh, he's been really, really good. Um, really good. I will, I will say, though, his last set, last few starts, Angels, Mariners, White Sox, Rays, Astros, Twins, Orioles, Common denominator, none of those teams really hit right-handed pitching really well. Not not to try to take away anything that that kid's done, um, but I'm starting to get the band back together, ladies and gentlemen. The only difference is instead of the Atlanta Braves this year, guys, it's the New York Yankees. Because uh, the, the, the similarities between last year's Braves and this year's New York Yankees are so daunting to me, it gets me all excited inside to fade this team come October. Um, best offense in the world, yada, 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 live and die by the long ball. Let's just see how that plays in October. We all know how that ended up blazing out. But anyway, I, yeah, Luis Hill's been absolutely fantastic in what they've been doing. Um, I, I do think it's funny, though, that like Juan Soto like makes it clear that he's not going to be signing with the Yankees 
as far as like giving them a discount or anything. Every time he gets the chance, he's like, well, you know, it just depends. And it's, uh, you know, whoever opens up their checkbook is where I'm going to go. So, yeah. <laughs> Like Hal Steinbrenner being like, well, we can't let the players do the market. I'm not trying to go over the luxury tax. Like, uh, it's going to it's gonna be fun to watch that all play out after they lose in the playoffs. That's for sure. So, Well, especially because yeah. Juan Soto was far from shy. Man, I mean, that, that guy, that yeah. guy's got an ego fit for the big apple. It, it's going to be really, really fun to watch those contract negotiations play out. Especially, like, you know, Soto had a press conference the other day I was watching. He said that he would entertain conversations from anyone in free agency – which usually it ends up being five to seven teams, no matter how talented you are, just because certain teams yeah. are completely unwilling to even approach that that level of uh, financial commitment. But if Soto was actually going to meet with like seven to ten teams and there's some teams willing to spend some money, because he's on the young side, man. Like if, he's one of the true – like he's one of the few guys that is entering free agency like really, really early to where a 10, 12-year deal could be legitimately justified for an organization, even like a – a, mi- a middle market organization. So it's going to be really interesting to see the list of suitors because you assume the Yankees, the Dodgers, the Mets, all the typical big players. But are there other teams that get in on the action if he does reach free agency? It's going to be really interesting to see. Yeah, I think the Cubs open up a big checkbook for Juan Soto. I think the Cubs make yeah. real. I think the Cubs would go hard after Juan Soto. Uh, you never know, but um, you, yeah. The Braves I, have I, money I, to spend. Like, no. Yeah, I, I yeah, I, I I feel like it's Cubs. I feel like putting him out there and Wrigley and the day and all that stuff. I can I can see it. Um, you never know though, but that's just I don't know why. I just feel like that's the team that I I'd like to see him go to. I think that that'd be really really cool for the game of baseball to have Sammy Sosa like things back in Chicago. That'd be really cool. Yeah, I agree. So, but the only other thing I want to touch on, you know, top of the show, major headlines and things like that, Emmanuel Classe. Has thrown 29 in the third innings this year. This man has given up one earned run. American League reliever of the month. Uh, the, the guy has been virtually unhittable. And I think what's even more impressive with this is he's been what he has been the most used reliever across the last three seasons. I mean, Tito ran this dude into the ground, and he's already appeared in what has he appeared in? 20 30. 30 Jesus, 30 games already this season. So he's well on his way to another 75, 80 appearances in 2024. I mean, this guy is just a robot going out there day in, day out, three, four times a week for the Guardians and has been a major, major reason why this team has been so successful early in the season because the Guardians, as good as the the Guardians offense has been at times, they have won a lot, a lot of like one, two run ball games and having Classe there in the ninth inning just be uber reliable over and over and over again. uh, I mean, you just can't say enough good things and people forget the Guardians got this guy for a washed up Corey Kluber. Like talk about a talk about a win what, what, for a trade. I remember a lot of Cleveland fans super pissed off shipping away Corey Kluber for what felt like nothing at the time. And then Kluber, of course, never did anything after he left Cleveland. And Classe has been arguably the best reliever in baseball across the last few seasons. Yeah, I mean that the Indians as a whole have been super super impressive. Uh, Cade Smith has just been like a revelation for them as well. He's been really really fun to watch. Um, big series for them coming up um, here this week as well as they take on uh, Kansas City, who's found themselves in a little bit of a rut. Uh, four and six, their last ten. Um, lost a series to Minnesota. Uh, they lost a series to the Padres. Uh, and the only win against the Padres they had was in a walk-off uh, ninth inning comeback on Sunday that they probably should have lost. Um, but it is what it is. Uh, so it'll be a big game. Tristan McKenzie versus Seth Lugo. Tristan McKenzie, a lot of success against Kansas City the last few years. So, uh, yeah, it'll be really, really fun to watch to see what happens with those teams. Yeah, 100% agree. Who would have thought Guardians against the Royals? I'm playing I know, for right? first place as we're getting close to the All Star break here. Seth Lugo, Seth Lugo, Tristan McKenzie, you gotta watch it. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll be in the Royals in that game for sure. I'm, I, I still don't trust Tristan McKenzie at all. But. Yeah, uh, me and Sauce are already on Cleveland. Yeah, well, we'll see. We'll see. That make for what? What day do they play? What, what day are those two guys pitching? Tomorrow they put oh. they play tomorrow. We've already bet it. Cleveland seven and three. Their last ten at home. The team that we love playing at home. Cleveland twenty and seven at home. 
Oh, my God. You already know, baby. Tristan McKenzie coming off two lackluster starts against Colorado, Inc., one of them being in Coors Field. His last two starts at home, like 11 innings, two runs total. Yeah, Cleveland. Well, I'll be on the live show Wednesday afternoon, and we'll, we'll, we'll see what the, the net result of that is. But but tell me, Toast, uh, you know, what, what's good around baseball? G- give me something to – Um. Well, one of my – quote unquote famous sayings that people like to steal from me is bet on pitcher. Um, and one guy that I wanted to make sure that everybody knew who's a bet on pitcher right now is Gavin Stone. Uh, Gavin Stone since April 26th, um, his last performance is seven innings pitched one earned, six innings pitched one earned, seven innings pitched one earned, six innings pitched one earned, six innings pitched four earned, seven innings one, I'm sorry, seven innings zero, five innings zero. 1.64 ERA over his last seven starts. That's third best in baseball uh, with pitchers over uh, with at least 40 uh, innings pitched. Um, I understand that some of the expected numbers aren't fantastic, um, but this kid is really, really coming into his own right now. Um, and, and again, I'm not going to go off on a tirade about him. Um, he plays on the Dodgers, so it helps that you have those bats behind you and whatnot. I, I will give you that. Um, but what this kid has been doing, um, having to step up in this Dodgers rotation with the injuries and whatnot, um, I think has been really commendable. So I just wanted to give him a little, quick little shout out on the show. Yeah, I've actually I've been really impressed with him, especially when you look at his pitch mix change that that he's made this season. It's really paid a lot, you know, enormous dividends for him. Really increased that sinker usage a lot against right-handed batters, and uh, you know, I mean, I, I talked about it all preseason. Like when you have a guy in Major League Baseball. Pitchers to be successful in baseball can be successful just a couple of different ways. You get strikeouts, even even more in your favor if you can get strikeouts and limit walks. But if you're not going to get a lot of strikeouts, you have to be able to induce ground balls. You have to be able to induce weak contact. And Gavin Stone has done you know a, a pretty solid job. I know the expected stats are not phenomenal, but I'll, I'll bring back up his savant page here, and you can see 87th percentile average exit velo, uh, 90 or 89th percentile hard hit rate not giving up a ton of barrels. When, when you're keeping the baseball off of the, the center of the bat, you give yourself a good chance, and especially like you said, if you have a pretty good offense behind you, uh, you know, he's he's definitely more finesse than he is sizzle, I guess you would say. But, I mean, the kid's 25 years old. He's he's really started to figure some things out. Sub-3 ERA through 11 starts. He's over 60 innings pitched already. The Dodgers are very, very happy with that, especially, especially when he's not counted on to be an ace. You have – you have your Tyler Glass now, and you have your uh, Yamamoto that you've paid the big bucks to be the the dominant one two at the front of your rotation. If you could have Gavin Stone be a really solid three or four in your rotation behind those two guys, and you got Betts, Freeman, Otani, Tioscar, and so forth in your lineup, Max Muncy hopefully be back pretty soon. Like, my God, Gavin Stone has been more than good enough for these guys. Well, and I think that's I think I'm glad that you said that because I think that's what keep for me. That's what's kind of what made me. I guess want to give him more props because he's been able to step up into this role. And so now you can honestly say that the Dodgers have glass now Yamamoto and stone and Walker as your one, two, three, four, not to mention you have a veteran lefty and James Paxton as well. That again, I understand same type of thing. The expected numbers aren't great, but regardless when James eight Paxton, and two and Paxton starts this year, I don't want to hear it. They find James ways Paxton to win. Pitches, the Dodgers have been winning games, uh, which my point being to all that is that now that that opens up the Dodgers being able to focus on the depth of their bullpen and improving some of those guys in the outfield over the trade deadline uh, and not have to worry about giving up guys to go get a big name starting pitcher because they don't have to worry about that uh, with the way that Gavin Stone's been pitching. So, uh, yeah, I, I just think that him pitching well opens up a lot more things than people realize. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that everybody, get, get, like I said, give Gavin Stone a little bit of flowers. Yeah, the other thing people I think are going to forget is Clayton Kershaw is going to come back and only be asked to throw less than half of a season. And Clayton Kershaw, when he's been, when he's been on the mound and been healthy the last few years, has been very, very good. I know he's on the older side at this point. He's had the health issues. But a lot of these postseason struggles we've seen have been, in my opinion, more about attrition than it has been about skill. You're not asking Kershaw to come back until really August. Can you just get him built up in August and September and just keep him healthy into October? And again, Kershaw's not asked, not going to be asked to go out and pitch game one of a series. You're going to have Glass now. You're going to have Yamamoto. You're probably going to have Gavin Stone in front of him. If Kershaw only has to pitch one game in a five-game series or potentially only one game in a seven-game series, this, this team is in very, very good shape on, on the pitching front. And it was a, a relatively slow week in baseball, but last week I told you guys 
Dodgers coming off of a very disappointing week. Betting the run line every single game that, that they played last week. Uh, you can see they, they, they took both games against the Mets at the doubleheader on Tuesday. Uh, beat the Mets again on Wednesday. They scored seven runs late. They did lose on Friday the Rockies, but they came back one four to one on Saturday. I played the super run line minus two and a half, which I also mentioned on the show last week, and then they won four nothing again on Sunday. So very very profitable week. We, we mentioned the Dodgers that all the stats showed that their regression had been legitimate, but we also talked about baseball being a season of of ebbs and flows, especially for teams that have been there and done that, and that really you just have to trust really good teams to come back and bounce back especially against weak competition like the Mets, like the Rockies, two teams that are, are obviously not very good baseball teams overall. So uh, for me, I mean, this is a, a pretty short segment, very short point for me this week. But the Dodgers, it was nice to see them come back, take care of business, finish the month of May strong. Uh, they, they have a pretty soft schedule coming up. Pittsburgh to start uh, to start the new week. They have to go to New York, which will be a good series. But then they come home, get Texas, KC, the Rockies again. The Angels, the White Sox haven't won in almost two weeks. The Giants have some injuries. The Diamondbacks are below 500. Uh, I mean, they're not really playing another good team after the Yankees until July when they when they host Milwaukee. So this could be a, a start of a really, really dominant stretch for the Dodgers. Yeah, they are just one of those teams that you just they keep on rolling. So um, I wasn't on them this week. I was uh, I played the Rockies on Monday and we played their unders. Um, glad you hit though. I wasn't paying those was prices. No chance in hell was I paying those prices uh, with them Dodgers over the weekend. But I'm glad that you cashed, my friend. I'm glad the way I look it. at it is I'm not somebody who locks in Dodgers minus one and a half every single day, set it and forget it. But the Dodgers this season, when they're coming off of a – like I look at the Dodgers on the run line by week. If the Dodgers have a, a week where they go like two and five or three and four on the run line, Almost every single time that has happened over the last two seasons, they've come back and absolutely dominated the week after. And we mentioned on last week's show they had lost five games in a row. First time since pre-pandemic they had lost five games in a row. They come back, they win five out of six against inferior competition. And now, again, they have Pittsburgh to start the week. The Yankees, that will be a really, really good series. Yamamoto and Glass now are pitching two of those three. The Yankees have Cortez and Gill for two of those three. Gavin Stone starting that third game for the Dodgers. So, uh, Apple TV, Fox, ESPN, all those games will be easy for people to watch. Uh, it should be really, really good baseball this weekend. Yeah. Do they face Skeens? Do you know? Yes, Wednesday. That's that's the matchup you want to watch. That's yeah, Paxton sure. against Skeens. So you could not get two more different pitchers. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm very, very curious to watch Paul Skeens. We're not going to get off on that tangent. But, yeah, I'm very curious to see how he ends up pitching. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah we'll put that. That'll be a good way. You, you want to hear about Paul Skeen's Wednesday live show. You'll hear plenty about Paul Skeen. <laughs> yeah, or next week, see, depending on how he pitches. We might talk about him on this show as well. <laughs> yeah. So, anywho, uh, what goes up must come down. Uh, you got the team that's going down right now or anybody that's yeah, in particular? Yeah, so baseball's, kind of baseball's kind of in a weird spot. It is. The last, the last 10 days where it feels like almost every single team across their last 10 games has been – between four and six and six and four with a couple exceptions. Mm -hmm. The one notable exception is the Chicago White Sox who have lost 11 games in a row. And I mean, that's two full turns with the rotation. They have not been able to buy a win. It's a bad team. I know I've been on here a couple of times this year talking about like, I believe in the White Sox. I believe in them to be able to bounce back and win close to 60 games. I I'm going to, I'm ready to jump off this ship. There's, they're just not hitting. They're just not hitting whatsoever. The pitching has been, very, very bad. They, they've had absolutely nothing from anyone outside of Eric Fetty. Uh, it's 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 just a bad situation in Chicago. They're really the only team that's really going down. I will say the Marlins, like I told everybody, they will finish with the second worst record in baseball because I bet them to have the worst record in baseball. Happens every single season, and they currently do have the second worst record in baseball. Other things I think just worth mentioning, Spencer Torkelson, option of AAA. Reed Detmers, option of AAA. Torkelson, monster second half to 2023. A lot of people were very, very high on him going into 2024. Had made some major strides against off-speed stuff and breaking balls. Had been hitting fastballs a lot better as well. Just has not been able to gain any traction so far in 2024. Not the worst thing in the world. Still a young-ish player. Hopefully you go down, figure some things out, come back and contribute to that team in the second half of the year. Reed Detmers, the stuff is good, man. I, like Reed Detmers is one of these enigmas in Major League Baseball that like he should be better than he is. I know that defense behind him has not helped him whatsoever, 
really, really bad luck on balls in play, but that like That's he's a got thing for him. It has I to really be I believe mean, that. The stuff is too good for him to just keep getting pulverized. Yeah, I, I think it's a mental thing for Reed Detmers. I mean, we saw how good he looked early on in the season. So, uh, like, like you said, the stuff is there. I, I think it's a mental thing for him. Whether it gets fixed or not uh, is to be determined. As far as Torque's concerned, yeah, I, I mean, he had a couple, what was it, a two-month span last week or last year. But besides that, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but – I'm pretty sure he's by <clears throat> excuse me by the numbers he's like the worst first baseman to ever play in Major League Baseball and I'm not even I'm not even making a joke when I say that uh, as far as like war and stuff like that I mean as you can see his savant page um, you don't want your chase when that that red in chase that's a bad thing by the way the the bad speed thing I guess is a good red thing but as you can see everything else is bad you don't want that chase in red so. Um, but regardless, um, it, it's just one of those things where he hasn't panned out. I don't know how long he stays in the minors, um, but they D Detroit definitely needed to do something because he was essentially just a dead spot in that lineup. Um, and now they're in a spot, as far as Detroit's concerned, um, they're in a spot where they've got to figure out what they're going to do. So, uh, I mean, you can't – if you're Detroit, you're not going to let – as much as we would all want it, you're not going to let Javi Baez – go or not have him not play because you're already paying him and he's a really good defender at short but my point to that being is that you can't have so that many dead bats in that lineup like you're already fighting for your life um and so when you have certain things like that happen like i i just feel like you got to change things up so riley Bean, riley green's been really good for them jack flaherty's been really good for them for some reason reese olsen has been pinched pitched really really well for them and they just do not do anything when he's on the mound um Detroit is a very, very a, a team that I, I can see doing making moves at the deadline and going to get guys. I can also see them selling selling some pieces off. Uh, they're in a really tough spot. So I, I'd like to see them buy because I, I truly believe that with Flaherty, Mize, Olsen, and, and Scooble, uh, I, I, I think that they could win a playoff series sneakily uh, with that pitching staff if they had the right matchup. So I know that that's crazy to say, uh, but they play in a division that – is essentially wide open right now. I understand the, uh, how, how well Cleveland has played early, um, but there's a lot of wild card spots. You never know what's going to happen. I, I wouldn't count Detroit out just yet, but uh, yeah, I, I've, like, talked way too, I've talked way too much about the Tigers already. No, but I, I think on that note, it's it's worth – I mean, the Tigers are way out of the division right now, but Cleveland's tougher does get way, way more difficult after the All-Star yeah. break. And Detroit, they're three and a half out of the wild card spot. They're built to win a three-game series in the postseason. If you, have, point, yes. if you have Scooby and Flaherty pitching two of those three games, that might be a wrap after two. They got they they yeah. have the high leverage arms in the bullpen uh, with Chafin, with Alex Lane. Uh, who was the other guy? I can't think of off the top of my head. Oh uh, no 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 no. Uh, we don't we don't talk about Alex Lane. He is dead to us. He's in AAA. He will not be pitching for us anymore. Bye bye. No, You're who's done. the guy I'm thinking of? No, who's it's not Lane. It's uh. Uh, Jason Foley, Fiedo, Foley, Foley. That's the guy. No, that's what I was thinking of. Foley. That's who I was thinking of. But they have high leverage arms that can compete in the back end of that bullpen. So if you get six out of Scooby, you get six out of Flaherty in a postseason game, and then you need three out of the bullpen back to back days. They can definitely do that. Five game series too. When you're getting three of those five games pitch from Scooby and Flaherty, uh, you know if the schedule works out in their favor, they're a team that they they just can't have, like. Javi Baez is, like you said, sub-600 OPS. Torkelson, sub-600 sub OPS. Colt Keith was going literal weeks without hits at, at points this year. So they're going to have to if – they, if they're serious, they're going to have to go get a bat. But I'm with you. It'll be interesting to see because they're kind of in this weird matrix area where, like, they're, they're going to be in there with KC, the Twins, the Red Sox, the Rangers, the Rays, like all these teams that they're not bad enough to be awful – but they're not good enough to like really solidify themselves a playoff spot or early in the like early in the regular season. So it'll be really, really interesting to see if they if they try to compete or if they do take the foot off the gas pedal a little bit around the all-star break. Yeah, um, I had a really funny stat about Javi Baez. Like his when when there's nobody on base, he's like a negative eight OPS plus, but with runners on base, he's like a like a 
what 160 OPS plus or something like that. Like it's absolutely unreal. Like how, the stark difference of when he has when there's people on base and when there's not people on base. Uh, and I, I saw that yesterday on the broadcast, and I just thought that was kind of funny. So I just thought that I would bring that up. So if you're uh, a live better and you see uh, Javi Baez uh, at the plate with somebody on, it might be worth. And I know that's as gross as that sounds, but it might be worth a couple shekels of your money because uh, he's been absolutely killing it with runners in scoring position uh, or runners on base in general uh, this year. You know what's nuts? We, we got to bring this up too because th- that's really good stuff. We got a lot of people who like bat speed in our comments every single week. Hell yeah. Javi Baez is a perfect example of <laughs> bat speed not being everything. Like bat speed is a prerequisite to be able to compete in the major wow. leagues unless you're a very, very outlier skill set like a Louisa Rise, a Stephen Kwan. Well, that and his outlier is his swing length. It's like, it's, yeah. it's, if you pull that up too, it's like the longest in Major League Baseball. It's like seven seconds. Yeah. Something crazy like that. But that's like, why, like, but that's what I'm saying. Like, so he has 90 second, second percentile back. bat speed, but he has a super long swing. So like there's, you can have great bat speed, but you, you have to be able to pair bat speed with good bat to ball skills. If you don't have any semblance of bat to ball skills, you could swing the bat 95 miles an hour. If you can't make contact, it won't happen. So that like that's where like I I don't ever subscribe to anyone who like devalues bat speed because bat speed is undeniably very very important and it improves bat to ball outcomes across the board. Helps you have better swing decisions if you have any idea how how to approach an at bat from a mental standpoint. But when you're as free swinging as Javi Baez is and you have literally no discrimination over what pitches you swing at, the guy has elite bat speed. It's one of the reasons that a team like Detroit gave him that big contract. But you can just see, I mean, like he fifth percentile ex Woba. I mean, he just doesn't swing at good pitches. When you're sw- when you're not swinging at good pitches and you're swinging at too many pitches on the edge of the zone, you see the second percentile chase rate right there, swinging at so many pitches outside the zone. No matter how much bat speed you have, if you're swinging at pitches that are really hard to hit, and you're putting them in play, you're not going to be able to drive the baseball. And also, just for the record, just because he has the longest swing length, doesn't that's not necessarily a bad thing either. I didn't mean it. I guess I should clarify that. I'm just saying that like, when you put those things together, that's when you can start having issues. Uh, other guys with very long swing lengths, J.D. Martinez, uh, this guy named Giancarlo Stanton, he swings the bat pretty hard. Uh, Nolan Arenado, he's the guy that kind of stands out in the group because he doesn't has a really bad bat speed. So it's a super long uh, swing with a super slow bat speed. That's usually not very good. You really have to have good contact skills to get behind that. Uh, and then the next guy in line is obviously Aaron Judge, uh, and we all know about him. So uh, not necessarily my point being necessarily if you have a long swing, that doesn't necessarily mean that's a bad thing. I just want to make sure that was clear. Yeah, there's just a lot more variance when right. you swing. A lot more. A lot more margin for air when your swing is seven feet long compared to, you know, six feet, five and a half feet. So uh, that's why, like, when you hear people say short to the baseball, especially, like, if you're a dad or you got a kid or, you know, if you're, you know, young kid playing baseball, like, when people say shorten up or, like, short to the baseball, they're, they're really trying to avoid those air and judge, like Giancarlo-type swings because there's not very many people who can rel- reliably, consistently repeat that bat path in an effective way. So, um yeah, if, if you're not built like Aaron Judge, it's probably best to, to <laughs> or to John Carlos. Out. <laughs> if you don't look like those two guys, probably better to, to to develop a little bit more of a compact swing. But but anyway, I picked on I've picked on Javi Bias enough. I, I think we can. I know you have some more positive things to touch on around the diamond with uh, the, some prospects, maybe some you know tr- trade things that you're starting to look at. We're getting relatively close to the deadline. You might see some some early shoppers start to to look around. Yeah, I, I think that that's that's just one of those things I wanted to talk about is like looking at the teams. We started talking about it a little bit with Detroit, obviously. Um, and then we also get teams, you know, again, like the Tampa Bay Rays. Like, what are they going to do? I mean, the Rays need, I mean, a lot to be considered a playoff team. Uh, do they start to sell um, a couple pieces? Obviously, they have to deal with the Juan DeFranco situation. He just got his leave extended uh, to administrative leave. Um, I can't remember what the exact date was, but whatever. Uh, uh, Isak Paredes has been like their very best player. Um, and Randy Arozarena has been really kind of struggling for them. They got guys like Zach Littell and Ryan Pepio. 
Um, you know, that they obviously just acquired, uh, like a Pepe they just acquired. Do they turn around and, you know, make a, I mean, we all know how good that the Rays are about ma- making trades for guys that nobody knows who they are and turning them into stars. I mean, it, would it be that crazy to see them ship off? I'm not saying that I think they're going to. I'm just saying, would it would it shock anybody if they sent off a Randy or Rose Arena for a, a trade package of guys of seven guys that we didn't know who it was? Like, it wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, I, I will say the one team that I think is, Kind of the most fascinating going could be the most fascinating going forward um and people are probably going to say i'm a little bit of a homer because they've made me a lot of money this year is the washington nationals um because i, I maybe not so much this year but what they do at the trade deadline might give us a little bit of a uh, a peek into what they're going to be trying to do in the off season uh because keep in mind i think the nationals are pretty happy with where they are as a core and then as soon as they get that money with strasburg and um uh, Patrick Corbin off the books. That's going to really, really open things up for them. Uh, they're going to have James Wood coming up. Um, who I guess he's land. I think he's on the IL now with a hamstring injury, but he's been really, really good in AAA, uh, hitting like slash line like 355, 465 with a sl- uh, 596 uh, with 13 doubles, nine home runs, 31 RBIs. He also stole 10 bases as well. Um, so I'm very curious to see like, do the Nats get rid of? Uh, Elaine Thomas, um, CJ Abrams is another guy for them that's had a little bit of a shoulder issue. He's been out the last couple games. Uh, I don't know how bad that is, but he hasn't been on the IL, but he's not playing. Um, and he keeps on getting scratched, which I, I just don't understand that. Um, but yeah, the, the Reds are another team that, I mean, what do you, I mean, what are they going to do? I mean, they have Christian Encarnacion, they have TJ Friedel, they have Jake Fraley, they have a whole bunch of these guys that, I mean, are good, but not great. Um, that a whole bunch, and not to mention guys like Neil B. Marte is on a suspension, Jonathan India, another guy, uh, Matt McClain, another guy, like all these guys in the infield, in the outfield. I mean, it's like the Reds have a surplus of guys. Some of them are suspended, some of them are hurt. Um, but what do they do with them? Do they tr- do the Reds try to buy and you know try to make a little bit of a playoff run? Do they sit tight? I mean, but they're not really you know, going anywhere, and they kind of I, I, that's what I was just going to say. they don't really have the, owner. They yeah. don't have the starters to go anywhere either with Hunter Green and Andrew Abbott and Nick Lodolo. So maybe they do try to unload a couple guys when they're, you know, at their maybe a little bit higher than we thought they would be um, and get a, and get something back for them. Um, the Jays, another team, like what the hell do they do? I mean, I understand oh, that they have, they, I, they I have. Mean, they're, they're so bad, but I mean, are they going to get rid of Bo and Vlad or, or both? I mean, I mean, who are you eligible? Have to get rid of one. I, I, you would assume so because they're available in free agency in 2025. Um, I, I have a hard time believing that they signed both of them um, to uh, long-term deals. Um, Why would you, Toast? I, you haven't won a playoff game with those two as part of your core. I, I, I'm just saying. Like, I, I'm just no, saying. I'm not, like, I'm not saying you're a saying. Blue Jays I'm saying, if the Blue Jays, no, like, I why would you? I, 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 to sell jerseys and stuff? I mean, people love Bo and Vlad. I mean, I, I'm being kind of – making a joke kind of, but I, I mean, seriously, um, I, I think that the Blue Jays could be in a really good, really good position to retool. Um, if they, if they were to trade some of those guys. So, um, For sure. do you think yeah. I should have the Blue Jays too much toast? No, I mean, I feel like, like I'd be I curious mean, if you're a Blue Jays fan and you're watching this show, what is your honest opinion of Boba shit? Truly? Yeah, I just want to know. Let's like, in the comment. What do you think about? Defensively, I don't care if you're running. a Blue Jays fan or not. Let me know, because I I like watching Bo Bichette hit. I, I but he defensively, it is so bad that it just makes you want to pull your hair out. Um, so and this is a team that's missed playoffs by one game. They've you know they've lost playoff series with the most improbable comp- You know the Mariners series when they're up what like eight to one or eight to two in that game. Uh, defensive miscues, like all of these things. Like, I think everybody looks at Boba Shett and they think, oh, like stud middle infielder, he can hit the shit out of the baseball. I'm I'm not going to go as far as to say it's like Boba Shett is a tremendous liability, but I think he has a high variance approach at the plate. He swings at literally everything, doesn't walk a lot. He's been on the IL the last couple of years, plays awful defense at, at, at one of the most important, if not the most important position on the diamond outside of catcher. Like, so I'm not trying to bias you. I'm just like, and if you think I'm stupid and you want me to kick rocks, like, let me know in the comments. I'm just like genuinely curious where people are at with Boba Shett right now. 
I, I and I will say not on a Bo Bichette thing, but a team that I know that's probably going to sell is the New York Mets. They, I mean, Alonzo, Marte, Bader, Quintana, Adafino, Dykeman. I don't not saying every single one of them goes, uh, but I bet you a lot of them go. Uh, I, I think that you have to, especially um, with the new ownership uh, and knowing that they're going to spend money in the off season. I think this is a really good time for the Mets. Even I understand. I, I've been saying they're going to trade Pete Alonso since the beginning of the season, um, and I, I think that and if they want him back, they can sign him back. But um, I think the, the again the Mets are going to sell a couple pieces, and then as far as everything else goes like i don't think there's a whole bunch of other teams that are going to be selling a whole bunch of pieces i don't really think that the white i honestly like the white Sox don't really have anything that you want i think the two teams that you watch are going to look at the most is the mets and uh the the marlins who have the best players that i think that you can get rid of because the marlins got guys like tanner scott and lazardo and you know josh bell is a decent bat i mean i i yeah so he's a um, trade deadline bat for sure like someone will yeah. take him for I mean, sure. I'd rather like I'd personally rather have a guy like Taylor Ward there rather than Josh Bell, but I don't know what the price for Taylor Ward would be. And I know uh, obviously he plays for uh, the Angels, but yeah, I mean maybe the Rockies get rid of a guy like Jalen Beeks, and I know that probably not very many people know that name, but uh, he's probably one. He's a really pretty damn good reliever. So um, yeah. I don't know if you're going to be able to pry any of the arms from Oakland. If you can get an Austin Adams or a Lucas Eckridge, so be it. I would do it in a heartbeat. I don't know if you're gonna if they're gonna do it or not. I don't know what to think of that Oakland team. But if you could get one of those two guys in your bullpen, that would be a, a really, really, really big piece for somebody, uh, especially going into the playoffs. So. I agree. It will it will be interesting to see. Baseball doesn't have a ton of impact players that I think are available for trade. Like Dylan Cease has already been traded. Uh, th right. there's other guys, you know, that are, that are hurt that, that, that could have been trade candidates. And, uh, you know, they're just, they're not going to be able to be moved. Uh, I think that the expanded wild card format has put a lot more teams into contention later in the season. So you see a lot more teams hedging or, you know, not making the big move They're you know, they're selling off smaller pieces to where they can still sell the fans that they're trying to be competitive for a wild card spot while at the same time, not selling out to try to make a wild card spot when it might only be a three game series. So It'll be interesting to see like the, the very few marquee pieces like a Pete Alonzo. Does somebody sell out and add a, a potentially tremendously impactful bat? Or is it just a, a year of Josh Bells being traded? It, it will be interesting to see. Yeah, I hope it's not a year of Josh Bells. I hope there's chaos at the trade deadline. That'd be oh, awesome. Me too. I, I want Pete Alonzo to go somewhere, man. Like I, I think Pete Alonzo is someone that just needs to get back into a competitive environment with a team that is on a postseason track. That yeah. dude's a gamer. That dude is a gamer. <laughs> He's going to see him. Uh, I would like to see him go somewhere a little bit more hitter friendly, but I also like Seattle. I, I like I want good things to happen for Seattle, so I would not be. Upset I just about I I don't want Vlad in Seattle. Like all my friends that I talk to that are Mariners fans, like I'm praying that you get Pete Alonso and not Vladdy Guerrero. I understand that that neither one of them are probably, but if I had to pick one, I'd much rather have Pete Alonso than Vladimir Guerrero personally. Um, I don't know about how you feel. Depends what the price is, I guess. I th that would factor in. For Just me. doesn't matter. Who do you want on your team right now? Vlad. <sighs> no way. I swear, you know, you say that, and then it's gonna be like the third inning, and he's gonna fuck up a routine double play, and you're gonna be like, "No, I no, say, I say it more so right. though, because if, if you get Vlad this year, you get him for another year as well, or Pete's a free agent." Okay, forget all that. Just player on player. Who do you want? Pete, Who would you rather Pete have? Alonso. Pete Alonso. Okay. That's what. That's where I'm. We're just going like just stretch run. Like I, I'm just. I only care about the next three months. Pete yes, Alonso. that's that was my point. That's that's what I was trying okay. to get at. Because man, I, I love Vladdy as a person. I love watching him play baseball. But and I don't want to be this guy. And I, I, it's kind of who I am though. But like I kind of think he might stink. There's a possibility that he might have had. Well, one well he doesn't players. stink. He doesn't. I said I said it's a possibility, man. We're not there yet. We are not there yet. But I'm just saying. It's a possibility. Stay tuned. Pause. Pause. Pause on this. So Vla I'm just saying, Vlad yeah. does not stink, bro. Vlad does okay. not stink. Okay. I think I think relative to our expectations of what he was, that like he has not lived up to the the godlike figure that everyone expected him to be coming out of the minor leagues. But 
this dude can ball. I mean, and I mean, he's for yeah, sure an above league it. average bat. He's 25 years old. That's the other thing. We got guys debuting at 24, and we've had you know multiple seasons of 25 plus home runs, 30 plus home runs from Vlad. He's still only 25. I'm not. I'm not sold on Vlad being a bust by by any stretch. I think that is definitely. I think that's definitely a stretch for a guy who has a in, you know 800 plus OPS this year. In it's June third. Uh, let's just make sure that he has. Yeah, that. But, he's got, but he's got a career OPS over 800. I mean, the, the guy isn't a bust. I think it's just he, he doesn't have. Career. Okay. Yes, he does because he had a one daughter OPS in 2021 playing in a kitty park. Uh, oh, he had a wow. decent. He had a decent 2022. He's he was dog poo poo last year, and he's been decent. Dog poo poo 789 OPS. Like he was dog poo poo relative to. MVP candidates, but he was still yeah. very, very good at the plate. He's like an average, average bat. Yeah. Oh, toast. A little toast. bit over, a little bit, a little bit ahead, a little bit over, a little bit over. I mean, Vlad's not scaring anybody, dude. That's all I'm saying. I guess that's all. And I'm not trying to be that guy. I'm not that's a hater. Fair. I like Vlad. Like, not scaring anyone to me is different than he sucks. I'm not trying to. Okay, but I guess my point to saying that he stinks is, is that when you say Vlad. You expect MVP type Vlad. But, Vlad has, but we're saying the same thing then. We're saying the same thing of like, he sucks relative to the expectations correct. that we have. Yes. Him. Yes. But he's I, very he's, cool. he's a, a very good hitter. Player. He's just yeah. not the MVP that goes with the cachet that goes with his name. I guess that's. Yeah. I can get behind that 100%. Also, when oh, you factor yeah. in how bad of a base runner he is, how bad of a defender he is. Like that, that's what that's, gets me lower I on. That on that is. Like that's what I'm talking. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's why I'd rather have Pete Alonso. I think that Pete Alonso is much better in the field. I, I don't think either one of them are going to run the bases very good. I've also never seen Pete Alonso make a bad base running play. I can think of like five or six for Vladdy. So again, I, and that's just my head. That doesn't, I have no numbers to prove that. If you have numbers to show that, Pete Alonso is a terrible base runner. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't surprise me. My point being is that I just think that Pete Alonso is a better baseball player. So uh, I, I think that he's better with runners in scoring position as well. So uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. Is he a kind of a weirdo geek? Yeah. The commercials <laughs> kind of freak me out with the hair. The, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> it's just I, I respect Pete Alonso. I, I think it's hard to do what you. I think it's hard to do his job uh, in New York. Uh, and he, he does it uh, pretty damn well. So I have a lot of respect for Pete Alonso. Yeah, so just for those at home, base running, fielding, these are the advanced metrics, and uh, and I'll be honest. like they're, Base running and fielding value, it, a little bit still in its infancy. Like we're still grain, editing. Grain of salt. Grain of salt. Yeah, the, definitely a grain of salt. It's also, I mean, you can see last year, he was pretty much league average as a base runner, league average as a fielder. This year it's, it's June. It's June 1st, or what is it, June 3rd today? And – his numbers have regressed a little bit. Like I wouldn't be surprised to see him get those back closer to league average by the end of the season. So I, I like Pete Alonso a lot. I think there's also something to be said. The guy has a little bit more big league experience. He's, you know, he's 29 years old and he's just, it, it's an intangible thing that almost makes me sick to stay as someone who's so data driven, but you bring Pete Alonso into your clubhouse. You are bringing like a, like you're bringing co are we, can we say cocaine on the internet? Is that it? You're bringing, oh, like, yeah. you're, you're bringing like a, a very high intensity drug into the into the clubhouse of someone who is killing to win, won 101 games with the Mets, and then they got bounced by the Padres. This is a guy who wants to win. Vlad hasn't won anything, man. Doesn't know how to win. Doesn't know how to bring in the you know any culture to to winning. Doesn't know how to complement winning. He just hasn't done it yet, and that's not even so much a slight on Vlad as he's. As much as it is, he's just 25 years old. So one-on-one, -on -one, three-month stretch, give me Pete Alonso for 2024 to answer your question. 100%. I think they're like the same running speed. What's his speed? Can you scroll down to Pete Alonso's speed? Do you have it still up or no? Never mind. Yeah, it yeah 15th percentile <laughs> for speed for, for uh, Pete and Vlad is 51st. So. But how often yeah. is Pete sprinting? Like that's the other, like that's I a, know, that's, well, what, I that's what I said. I, I, that's why I was like, you know what? Forget it. We've already talked too much about that. Yeah, so. <laughs> so well, anyway, let us know, Pete, Peter, Vlad. You let us know. Next yeah, three please days. let us know, Peter, Vlad. I would love to. I love to hear these in the comments. You don't have to give us a reason if you don't want to, but uh, I, I would like to know, Peter, Pete, or Vlad, and does both suck? Two answers. <laughs> you need to know. So.
Yeah, no, for sure. And and it feeds right into our, our you know our Q and A section, guys. Like I think genuinely, what we want to see, you know, week in and week out. Like I know some people we've had comments where it's like, oh, I've asked too many questions or this and that. Ask as many questions as you want. You know, we'll, we'll get to as many as we can while keeping the show length around an hour each week. Uh, we have one question this past week. Curious uh, question here. What do you guys make of the AL Central? How do you think the standings compare now to the end of the season? Your projections, given current info, et cetera. Uh, this person feels like it's under an under underrated division at the moment in the grand scheme of things. I'll just bring up the the standings just so everybody can see. But the Guardians are 39 and 20. They've been absolutely phenomenal. The Royals really, really having a good start to the season. The Twins are in third place, but by no means are, have they been bad. And the Tigers, like we mentioned, are only three and a half games out of a wild card spot in fourth place here. What do you think, Toast? I mean, this division, you know, the one, two, three, four that it is right now. I mean, it's safe to say the White Sox are going to come in dead last in this division. But wh- right. where do you have these teams finishing one through four when it's all said and done in September? Um, I think if I had to put my money on somebody, it would probably be Cleveland. Um, and I know that they're already winning the division. So I was trying. Look, okay, I'll, I'll start over. I was trying to say the Royals. I really, really was. Uh, my issue is that team on the road is so different than when they are at home. Um, at home, top 10 lineup, maybe even better, um, especially against right-handed pitching. Um, on the road, they drop to like the bottom third. Um, they, they just, they're just not the same team on the road, not to mention the fact that they have a couple guys in the rotation, uh, especially like guys like Brady Singer that kind of struggle within the division. Uh, our buddy Prop Beaver has kind of put shined a light to that. Um, and so that kind of worries me about a team like the Royals. I, I do think that they could make a couple moves to like make their team even better a little bit. Um, but at the same time, it's just one of those things where it's just really hard to step in front of Cleveland considering how well that they've played um, with their bullpen um, and whatnot. So for me, it's Cleveland. Um, I wish I could get to the Royals, but I just couldn't get there. Um I don't really worry about the twins too much. I, I know that their pitching is decent. Um, I know that they have a good story, but there's just, to me, it's, they're still going to be Minnesota. I know that they wouldn't made the playoffs last year, but um, I, I still lean Cardinals or Royals and guardians for me. I think I put Cleveland and then Minnesota and then the Royals is how I would put this. I wouldn't be surprised if Detroit came up and got third place either. I, Kansas City's really impressed me with, with what they've done, but I think the home and away splits, to your point, are are right. worth paying attention to, especially like you mentioned Brady Singer with the, the struggles in the division, but you also have guys like Seth Lugo, Michael Walker, who are built to pitch in big ballparks like KC, and they've had the benefit of being in San Diego. Like, I think there's a lot of legitimacy to when you're pitching in a big ballpark like Coffin Stadium. Those guys can be very, very good if they have to pitch in – Yankee Stadium, if they have to go to you know Cincinnati, like places where it's more of a launching pad, those guys become a lot less effective in those circumstances. Whereas I think Scooby, uh, Jack Flaherty, Reese Olson, Pablo Lopez, uh, Joe Ryan, like those guys can pitch anywhere. And and I know you're not a big Pablo Lopez guy, but you know th- those are guys who have proven time and time again they can pitch in, in in any ballpark, anytime. Joe Ryan especially has been even better this year after another visit to drive line. The Twins, obviously, their offense is very, very inconsistent. They, they've they not been able to stay healthy. They have guys like Correa who are consistently dealing with something. Buxton has been healthy maybe 20% of his games the last three seasons. Uh, Royce Lewis has been in and out of the lineup. Like there's lots of, there's lots of reasons to not be super optimistic about the Twins offensively, but the bullpen is very, very good, very deep. They have the starting pitching. Detroit, I think it really just depends, like we talked about earlier, like how aggressive do they want to be at the deadline, but – Cleveland, they they still have another 20, 30 games on their schedule where it's like, man, like these are really, really beatable teams. And they're they're 39 and 20. You know, if you just round to 40 and 20 through 60 games, they have 102 games left at that point. I mean, shit, they they need they need to win 45 out of 102 to, to maybe win this division. I think they're they're in really, really good shape. They've beaten up on teams early in the season that they need to beat up on. They've beat some good teams as well. You mentioned the record at home, 20 and 7 at home. They've been one of the best home teams in baseball. Uh, the Phillies are twenty-five and nine, are, are right up there. The the Yankees, I know, have been really really good at home, eighteen and eight as well. But the Guardians at home, I mean, they just know how to get it done. 
Uh, again, it helps when you have Colossae in the ninth inning. You have you know good bullpen management, some guys in the bullpen overachieving. So I think Cleveland's in a spot where they're able to get it done in part just because they, they've been able to jump out at such a big lead. The Twins, I have number two. I'll put Detroit number three just, just to be a little trendy. And then uh, I think the Royals could still finish around 500 and be in fourth place. But this division overall, they don't have the toughest strength of schedule. I think talent-wise, they're not as good as some of the other divisions in baseball, but I think they're going to end up winning more games than – in American League West, I think they might even end up looking somewhat similar to the American League East in terms of total wins, even though, you know, I don't think many people would argue the Yankees, Orioles, Red Sox, Rays are probably a, a better combination talent wise than the Guardians, Royals, Twins, Tigers. Yep, I agree. So, can you still hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, my everything on my screen is frozen, so I can't do anything. So I could, I just wasn't sure. Well, so. well, let, let's uh, let, let's wrap it up then with a couple of feel good things, uh, and we'll get out of here before your technology decides to totally crap out on us. Yeah, I wish I can't really even add anything because I don't have my notes now. So uh, I really <laughs> had a cool story about beer night. That's what you brought up. You you spent beer me. night in Cleveland, and now I can't tell it. So I apologize to everybody. Yeah. Well, Albert, a- anniversary of Ten Cent Beer Night for those who don't who don't know the story. There was there was a game, uh, how many twenty something years ago at this point, where in Cleveland they offered ten cent beer at the stadium, and it turned into one of the most wild events in in human recent human history at a sporting event that that I think you could ever imagine, and it's never been replicated. But if you go to Guardians games now, like you still see people wearing the ten cent beer night shirts. Their stories that have been passed down. Uh, okay, you know, I got it. I got it. I got it. He's okay. back. I God, that was going to bother me. All right. Listen to this. The attendance that night, 25,134 beers sold that night. 65,000 beers were sold in Cleveland that night. Uh, it was just unbe- unbelievable what ended up happening. Fans, fans ended up getting up, coming onto the field and f- fighting and all that stuff. Uh, it was just absolutely ridiculous. The, the fans were throwing firecrackers at people in the seventh inning. Fans tossed a string. Or it was in the seventh inning. Fans tossed a string of firecrackers near the Rangers bullpen, forcing the relievers to scamper across the field. Um, Cleveland relievers followed suit a half inning later. Uh, it, it's just it was just absolutely ridiculous. Uh, cops were saying that 14 year olds were drinking. Or, uh, guys were who were 14 were drinking beers. Uh, there was like no limit. It was just an absolutely crazy story. There's a whole uh, story about it in the athletic. If you have it, it's worth the read. Um, just absolutely insane. Uh, it quotes something like, you could see that there was some sort of a riot psychology. You have to realize all I had to do is protect myself with my fists. I mean, the quotes are just absolutely classic. So if you got five minutes and if you have the athletic, I would go ahead and read that because it's, uh, it's awesome. Yeah, they do some good stuff at the Athletic. That's really, really good journalism. I think, especially for baseball, they have some really good writers over there. Yeah, yeah, they do. They do a really good job. Yeah. Well, anything else before we get out of here, Toast? Nope. That'll be it. Um, yeah, same time, same place next week. Uh, Questions, comments, concerns. We're going to try to change up a little bit of the segments instead of like going up and going down, uh, trying to talk more about prospects talk, talk talk more about teams and uh what's going with that as far as the trade line and stuff like trade deadline and stuff like that uh buying and selling you know that, that thing uh things like that can change in an instant so uh get more into that so i appreciate everybody reaching out liking the video watching the video uh it's been really really cool i really appreciate that so uh commission i don't know if you have anything else to add but i know i don't yeah i think just you know get as much as many questions as you guys have i mean we'll sit here and we'll do 40 minutes of of questions if you guys have segment ideas things you want to hear i mean we're really doing this we love talking baseball with each other and we, you know we really appreciate all the the support and the comments and it sounds like you know you guys enjoy talking baseball along with us which we really really appreciate but yeah i mean if there's stuff that you guys want us to talk about you have questions uh things about the game you know people that you want to bring on i know we've had a, a couple of requests for prop here so we'll do our best to get him on uh when it's upcoming weeks but yeah just let us know man i mean we're, we're here evolving the show with your interest we want this to be a good show for you guys as well so uh just we, we really appreciate all the enthusiasm the shares almost twenty thousand views in 10 episodes is unbelievable like i just i'm just so 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 grateful so uh really appreciate everyone best of luck with your bets this week enjoy watching some baseball whatever level of baseball you're watching college world series mlb yeah. all that stuff just enjoy some baseball go oregon state
<laughs> All right. We'll see you, everyone. Have a good night, guys.